My name is Larry Haney, and I'm here to do the, the talk on the prodigal son. Any prodigal sons in here? Uh, my scripture passage of scripture comes through Luke 15, 11 through 28, or 32. We'll see where the Lord goes. And open with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this time, this day, this weekend. And Father God, please, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit into this place, Father God, that you move on every man that enters. And Father God, that uh, we open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. I pray for all the speakers, for your words to be spoken, Lord. And I pray for lives to be changed. I pray for decisions to be made this weekend, Lord. Father God, that uh, the angels in heaven are rejoicing because children are coming home. Father God, I pray just for everything. We thank you for what you are, who you are, and what you've done, and what you're continuing to do. Most of all, I thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, Luke 15, starting in 11. Then he, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Now he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And when he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and, but, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So what this younger son actually told his dad when he says, divide to me your, my portion, was, Dad, I don't care that you're alive. I want what I'm going to get when you're dead. I want what's mine. Can you imagine? I thought about this if, if my kids said this to me. Hmm. But for those of us who have went away from God, if we've ever had a relationship or we knew about God and we walked off, that's what we did. We walked away from our Father in heaven. But it didn't, said it didn't take him very long after he left that he wasted everything that he had. Just wasted it. Now we don't know for sure what he had, but I'm sure he got quite a bit. Anybody wasted everything you have? Hmm? How many has been in want? Needed more? That's what the world teaches us. There's never enough. Always want more. Always want more. How many of you would like to have eaten pig slop? Hmm? He said that he would like to have. But as a servant, he couldn't even eat that. He had to continue to give it to the pigs. 17 is the first scripture that really stands out. But when he came to himself. At some point in our lives, when we're out there flailing around in this world, away from our Father in heaven... We have to come to ourselves. 
You can say whatever you want. You've hit rock bottom. You've, you have nowhere to turn. You have to come to yourself and realize, I'm lost. I'm in a dead-end situation. I'm not going anywhere. And we have to come to a realization that there's only one way to get back to where we want to be. And that's to turn to our Father in heaven and say, I'm repenting. Now, the scripture says that this son thought this as he was feeding the swines. He says, man, my father's servants have better than I do. Man, I'm just going to go back to him and I'm going to say, Father, I'm sorry. I don't deserve to be your son, but man... Father, please let me be a servant. They have more than I have now. That didn't get him anywhere. He didn't make the right move until he went. We can think it all we want, but until we take that action, until we take that step back towards God. Scripture says that we must submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to us. We have to take that step. But God will not, will not, not answer his prayer or what his word says. And he says that he will step to us. So he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Do you know your father in heaven is looking and watching for you? The son didn't make it all the way back. The son just got there. He said he was still a far way off when the father saw him. God knows your heart. He knows the motives and the intentions of what you do. And if you're right, he sees you. And trust me, he's going to come and he's going to embrace you. But you have to make that decision. You have to take that step to return to God. God's going to draw. There's so many of you this weekend that is going to feel things and feel something that you don't understand. That's God drawing on you. Scripture says that no one comes to the Son unless the Father draws. And we're, I've been praying, a lot of people have been praying for the Holy Spirit to be drawn on you men. Please do not reject that draw. Do not. But God will come and he will throw his arms around you. He has compassion and he will kiss your neck. It said, and the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, but I'm, I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, didn't even answer the son, didn't even ask him, say no, never mind. The father just said to the servant, put a robe on him, put, sand, put a ring on his finger and put sandals on his feet. Now, in, in the Greek, uh, Mr. Ken Hathaway, he's not here. He gave me this paper last, last time when I'd done this. The robe is a symbol that you're an honored guest in the Father's house. God puts a robe on you because you're an honored guest in his kingdom. The ring is the family seal, means you're a member of the family. And the sandals were symbolization, symbolization that you're part of the household. The servants were barefoot. Now think about this. This son asked his dad for his, all his inheritance and then went and wasted it and come back and the father just restored him. Whoa. Got fully restored. I don't care what you've done, how far away you stepped from God. If you return, take the step, you're restored to what Todd or Mark said. A child of the Most High God. What Ziggy said, a child of the one true God. I hear of parents and kids having fallen out and taking years to restore that relationship. This right here says our Father doesn't take years. It says he meets us before we get there. The love that he has for us. The love that he has for mankind. You guys do understand that he loved us enough that he sent his own son to die on a cross? To shed his blood? That's how much he loves you and how much he wants you to come back to him.
For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. It says over in, in, in 15, number 7, it says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I say this every time we have an event. I want the angels in heaven to be rejoicing so much this whole weekend. Guys, you got a decision to make. As Doug said, we're not, none of us are here is going to force you. You have that free will. But guys, you do have a decision to make. In Joshua, it says, choose you, for, choose you this day who you will serve. When this life is over and we're going to stand before God, that's too late to make that decision. You have to make the decision to follow Christ on this side of death. And the last time I checked, I think the death rate's 100%, guys. I don't think anybody gets out of here alive. When's your time? Scripture says that we're not guaranteed our next breath. So I don't want some of you out there thinking, I got time. There's still living I want to do. There's still some stuff I want to waste. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You talked about, no, Ziggy talked about the bicycle. I need some time, Zig. I get on my bike too. Except for it's got a motor on it. <laughs> of course, you can tell that by the, our physiques. They're a little different. <laughs> I want to look at the second part of this. It's not part of the, the handout, but it's the older son. In verse 25, it says, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the, to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was hungry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandments at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. We cannot be jealous of someone who's had a rough life, lived a life totally away from God and come and see God's blessings upon him and then get angry. Because people who get angry when they see God blessing people and say that they've been Christians, they're wasting what God has for them just as much as the one who went out and wasted it away from him. Who here doesn't think God has a call on their life. I'm glad to see no hands go up. Because I don't care where you're at, where you've been, God has a call, God has a purpose. God knows every hair on your head. He knows your end time. But it's just up to us to come in alignment with him to fulfill the purpose he has for us. Now, the volunteers are all here fulfilling the purpose that God's called them. The rest of you, the offenders, you didn't choose to come here. God ordained this time for you. Now, whether you're walking in the gift and the call of God on your life, or if this weekend is the start that you're going to start walking in the call of God on your life. Again, I said earlier, you're going to have a draw. At some point at this weekend, you need to make a commitment with the Lord. Get with your table leader. 
get with one of the clergy, don't wait. We're here to lift up our risen Savior and the Father, but we also have an enemy that's going to try everything he can to keep you from making a commitment. Don't give him a foothold. Don't listen to him. Make a commitment. Because it takes one moment in time for your life to change. Most of the believers, anybody who's accepted Christ, they can tell you pretty much the moment they accepted. Because it says we become new creations. The old is gone. That the prodigal son decided when he had come to the end of himself, that was the moment he turned. What's your moment of turning? What is your moment, defining moment in your life when you're going to stand upon the rock, when you're going to stand upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and start building your life, your life in him? Guys, I'm sorry. The lives you build, they crumble. The life I built before I gave myself to the Lord crumbled. I'd put a stone up and it'd fall. I'd put two stones up and it'd fall. It wasn't until I built on the foundation of Jesus Christ that anything stood. Anything had any meaning. Interact with your tables. Ask the questions. Ask the tough questions. That's what we're here for. If you don't want to do it at your table... Get with your table leader. Get with the clergy. Men, I'm telling you, this is important. We have to have that relationship with Christ if we want to live eternity in heaven. Because if you don't, I'm sorry for people who don't believe, but there is a hell. And for those who don't make a commitment to Christ, that's where your eternity lies. As brothers in blue, we come in here to give you a foundation, to give you the option, and to show you that there's hope, there's love, there's forgiveness, there's redemption, and his name is Jesus. Nothing matters but where your relationship with is this. Everything else is going to burn, everything else is going to fall. When you die, your accomplishment depends on where you are with Christ. I thank you for this time. Let me end with prayer. Father God, I thank you. I just thank you for this time. I don't understand everything that you're doing, but I trust you. And I know your will is perfect. And I just give this assembly to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen.